Again, my name is Glenn Davis, the pastor of Chi Alpha Christian Fellowship at Stanford University. So good to have you with us. We're continuing our series, Embracing Faith, where we examine misconceptions people hold and, and objections people have to the Christian faith. And so uh, the format we follow is very, very simple. I talk about what Christians believe, and then we, we examine whether or not that belief is plausible. Does it hold water when you dig under uh, the surface and start to kick the tires some? So today's topic is the church. Uh, why do Christians love the church so much when so many people are convinced it is an oppressive, hostile institution? Great question. Let's start with what Christians believe. Uh, it's summarized well in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. It's a very bold claim that where the church is gathered, not a building, not the, not the structure called the church, but the community called the church, where God's people are gathered, God's spirit is there in their midst. Jesus said in another context, if two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That we believe that when we come together, God is there, that we are a, a, a community in which God's glory is revealed. Now, that makes the church precious. It makes it amazing how precious. Well, the value of something is, is demonstrated by what someone is willing to purchase it for. Acts 20, 28. Paul admonishes the leaders of the church in Ephesus. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. It was bought with the blood of God, with the blood of Christ. That's how precious the church is to him. He died to bring the church into being. Maybe another way to get at this is to use this, this phrase that we use to describe the church, the body of Christ. Why do we love the body of Christ? Because we love Christ. I mean, imagine if you had someone you said you were, was your friend who you couldn't stand to be around. Like when I come, you're like, ah, oh, you revolt me. You're horrible. You're repugnant. Get away from me. Ah, go, go. Is that your friend? No, that's not your friend. You don't actually like them. You maybe like something about them, but you don't like them. We love the body of Christ because we love Christ. We really do. We love every part of him. And this is one part of who he is. Now, having said that, if you don't love Jesus, there's no guarantee you're going to love the church. In fact, pretty much I can guarantee you're not going to be thrilled with certain aspects of it. And we see this all over the place. For example, on Facebook earlier this week, maybe late last week, one of my friends uh, posted a rant, a full-on like seven, nine-paragraph rant on Facebook. And his status of it was just like this huge wall of text, like, dude, get a blog. But three of his paragraphs stood out to me. He said, I'm pissed off that churches who claim not to be business and pay no taxes received billions of dollars of the PPP money that was supposed to go to small businesses. I'm pissed off that churches pay no taxes and then violate the IRS rules about endorsing political candidates. I'm pissed off that churches receive taxpayer money in the form of school vouchers to teach children garbage. Whoa, he's got opinions. Or I think about, in a more subtle way, an article that I read in the New York Times. Uh, I think it was last week. Um, it's called, Churches Emerge as Major Source of Coronavirus Cases. And I quote, more than 650 coronavirus cases have been linked to nearly 40 churches and religious events across the United States since the beginning of the pandemic, with many of them erupting over the last month as Americans resumed their pre-pandemic activities, according to a New York Times database. 650 is a lot, and every one of them is regrettable. Wish no one got sick. But let's, let's just take a moment and put that in context. There are 3 million coronavirus cases that have, that have ensued in America since the pandemic began. 3 million. 650 out of 3 million. Let's, let, let's, let's actually uh, break that down a little bit. That is um, uh, not much. So imagine, if you will, that I had 3 million pennies. In fact, here's a photo of 3 million pennies. A YouTuber gave away 3 million pennies to, uh, one of his, to his 3 millionth subscriber on his YouTube channel. So this is a photo of 3 million pennies. 650 of those are the problem. 650 of those pennies. These little things right here. Add 650, that's $6.50 out of $30,000 is what you write the article about. Now, why would you do that? Is that that's, can we agree that's not the most obvious choice? When clearly there are many, many other vectors, some of which are, are no doubt institutional, that are much more 
conducive to the spread of coronavirus. The only reason that story gets written is because an editor or a journalist somewhere in their mind has a suspicion about the church. They, they're not thrilled with the church. They, they view it as a malign influence, as a negative. There's, there's, there's something sketchy. There's something suspect about this entity. And so they, they look at it when they see evidence of wrongdoing or of something bad happening. They think, aha, their, their assumptions are confirmed. And then they rush to write an article. And I don't know anything about these particular journalists, so I don't hold them specifically accountable. It's, it's interesting that this would be written. Where's that come from? It doesn't come from a place that thinks the church is awesome. That's for sure. So why, why would perhaps these New York Times uh, journalists or their editor, um, why would my friend on the internet think so poorly of the church? Well, my friend just said it straight up. He thinks churches take more than they give. They're leeches on society, that they pay no taxes, they do all these horrible things. They don't contribute to the common good. They're not, they're not positive influences on the communities that they're a part of. Uh, then I think a related idea and this is not something that, that anyone that I've quoted so far has said, but I think you'll agree the idea is out there. There are people who just don't trust the church. They think it's a hotbed of hypocrisy. It's a hypocr hypocritical institution full of hypocritical people, and it does horrible, wicked things like, like, like sexual abuse and covering it up. Um, and then maybe a third reason that people don't like the church is that, that, that church, that, that organized religion in general does bad things to people. It makes them intolerant and judgmental. Uh, you start hearing words like homophobic and transphobic and misogynistic uh, and, and white supremacist and, and just these horrible ideas uh, that, that get thrown around. Um, and, and so people are very just nervous about the idea. So here's the question. Are these reasonable claims, reasonable criticisms to levy against the church? Well, let's take them one at a time. First, the idea that churches are, are leeches on society. They're, they're parasitic institutions. Uh, there's a researcher from the University of Pennsylvania, Ram Sanan, a sociologist. And he was he's been studying the impact of religious institutions for about two decades now. And uh, Dr. Sanan uh, gave an interview earlier in 2020. And this is what he had to say. He says, people don't look at the value of the congregation financially. They look at the spiritual aspect. Now, I'm not a person of faith. I'm a social scientist. I started to look at the congregation as an economic engine. What is the value that an urban congregation on average contributes to the local economy? In the first study, in 1996, we went to 10 congregations in Philadelphia and we looked at the replacement value of social services, like finding people jobs. On average, it was $140,000 per year. Of course, social services is only a small component of what congregations do. So next, we looked at 90 churches in Philadelphia, Chicago, and Fort Worth, and all the ways they contribute to the local economy. There was a range. Each generated between 1.2 and 2.5 million annually. Each of the 90 congregations in these three urban areas that this sociologist studied contributed between 1.2 and 2.5 million dollars to the local economy in, 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 in positive value. That's an astounding number. Elsewhere, uh, he says that the average value is $1.7 million. And he also said, and I quote, 87% of the beneficiaries of the community programs and events housed in sacred places are not members of the religious congregation. In other words, most of the benefits go to those outside. Most of what a church does blesses the community that it's a part of. And just think about the life that you've, you've seen, the, the, the experience that you've had. You, you know churches as places where the hungry can go and get food, where the broken can go and get healing, where, where the homeless can go and find social services, where, where the confused can go and get counseling. Churches are truly salt and light in this broken world. They're not leeches at all, which is why later in that first interview, Dr. Sinan says, I always ask, why does no one want to tax museums? I've never seen any museum serving soup to the hungry, and I'm not talking as someone who hates museums, but there's no museum in Philadelphia where you can drop your kids off from 1 p.m. and pick them up again at 6 p.m., and for churches, this is not so strange a thing. If I could turn for a moment from, from the skeptic to the believer in my address, you're a follower of Jesus. I hope that this encourages you, but here's my challenge to you. Live up to it. Be an agent of blessing. Every week I conclude these services by saying, our God is in the blessing business and that means we are too. I really believe that. That we are called to be agents of blessing. And we do that individually and we do it corporately. Now, most of it is going to be individually. 
you are going to go as a member of the Stanford community and find ways to help Stanford do the things that Stanford values insofar as they are not sinful. And many of the things Stanford seeks to do are wonderful and glorious, and we can in good conscience get wholeheartedly behind them. And we do. I think, for example, about the people who've gone to become RAs, necessary part of the campus community. They've done it because of their faith in Jesus. They wanted to serve and love and bless, and they've sometimes taken the hardest RA jobs they could find in order to be the biggest blessing. That helps the university fulfill its mission. The university's main mission, though, is research. How does Stanford help with that? How does Calif help Stanford with that? Uh, actually, very directly. Think about a professor that I had lunch with uh, fall quarter. Um, when he came to Stanford, he was not a believer, got involved with Chi Alpha, came to faith, PhD candidate in chemistry um, from China. And he um, came to Chi Alpha as he began to grow in faith. We had a guest speaker one day, another professor at Stanford, who shared a sermon about science and faith, and it changed. It changed the way my friend thought about his research. It actually gave him a new research agenda, literally changed his topic. He went back in, went on to do a postdoc at Harvard, and is now at Stanford as an assistant professor of chemistry because of a sermon. Chi Alpha is blessing the Stanford community. I think about the awards. Stanford, uh, another thing that Stanford greatly values is prestige. <laughs> you don't have to pay much attention to Stanford cares a lot about itself. Stanford's highest value is Stanford. And so one thing they love is, is those lists of all the people who win the national awards. The Stanford Daily every year around graduation, they print up a list of everyone who got a Rhodes Scholarship, one of these other big prestigious prizes. One year, um, I was looking and I noticed that there were 30. And that stood out to me because I noticed there were three people in Chi Alpha who had won these prestigious prizes. Three out of 30. 10%. Now, if you're just joining us online, if you're an incoming frosh or you're, you're maybe just checking Kyle out because a friend invited you, we're glad to have you with us, but you don't know anything about us. I assure you of this. We are not 10% of the campus community. We are nowhere near that. We're punching way above our weight class. Why? Because we believe that we are called to be agents of blessing. We believe that God blesses us in order to bless others. And when will you adopt that mentality? God, I want to be blessed so that I can be a blessing. God tends to pour out his blessing in major ways, major ways. And I think that we've seen the fruit of that in our community. So bless Stanford. And then when you graduate and move on someday to be part of a church in whatever community you go to, find a church that is a blessing and seek to make it even more of a blessing to its community. Now, I can imagine a skeptic saying, eh, maybe, maybe if you just look at raw numbers, you can make a case that churches are not leeches, that they're in some way beneficial to the, to the civic fabric. I, maybe, maybe. But even if that's the case, I don't like church because... The church is a hotbed of hypocrisy, and they do wicked things, evil things. Churches are, are institutions that prey upon the vulnerable. The preachers just in it for the money. They're wicked, wicked entities. Now, um, and you, you see this portrayed um, in, in the media um, sometimes, that if there's a priest figure or a pastor figure in, in a movie, odds are they're not the hero. At best, they're a, they're a naive, easily misled, gullible fool. At worst, they're the actual serial killer, which is a plot that has been used in more TV shows and movies uh, than are probably easily countable because people are suspicious. They don't, they don't actually uh, believe that the church is about what the church claims to be about. And that particularly, this issue of uh, the sexual abuse of minors has become a real hot button, and understandably so. I mean, it's a vile thing. I would, I would go on record, and I will right now go on record, as saying it is a, 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 a blasphemous abomination for a church to, to shelter, to nurture, to in any way permit the abuse of children. Jesus, our Lord, said in Mark 9, 42, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Jesus says, don't mess with kids. Don't mess with kids. Now, Having said that, the claim is more than this is something that has happened before. Well, of course it is. There's 400,000 churches in America, give or take. Almost everything has happened at some church. The, the, the claim is not that it's happened, but that it happens, that it's a thing, that is somehow endemic to the nature of churches, that is a manifestation of our perversity, that this, this wickedness keeps manifesting. And that's a testable claim. Now, I want to stipulate that, that data is, is very hard to come by in this area, that everything is probably underreported at some level, but you can still get some ideas by looking at, at just raw numbers of allegations. So I'm going to mention the Catholic Church because that is the re that's the institution that's been the most studied. It's come under the most scrutiny in this regard. From uh, 1950 to 2002, a little under 11,000 people reported being abused by a member 
of the Catholic hierarchy. Now that is a horrific number. One is too many. 11,000 is, is, is stomach turning. Over the course of five decades, 11,000 should grieve the heart of every person who has a conscience. But with that number as an anchor, it's very interesting to look into the research of Dr. Carol Shakeshatz, professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. She was the one tapped by the Department of Education to write a research paper, uh, Educator Sexual Misconduct, a Synthesis of Existing Literature. Showed it for the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, and she estimated that, and I quote from an interview she gave, the physical sexual abuse of students in public schools is likely more than 100 times the abuse by Catholic priests. The extent of sexual abuse in public schools, she says, is a hundred times worse than that perpetrated by the Catholic hierarchy. She estimated that about 290,000 students were victimized between 1991 and 2000. Now, now numbers come at you fast. Let me, let me rewind and replay that very slowly. From 1950 to 2002, that's five decades, a little under 11,000 people. And just in the Catholic Church, by the way, so there's more churches than that. Let's multiply it by five to include a lot more Protestants. So let's bring it up to, to maybe 60,000 people. Um, again, horrible number. That's over five decades. In one decade, 290,000. That's staggering. Now, this should not be surprising to anybody who actually understands the way that sexual predators work. They seek the place where they can have the most concealment, they have the most access to the, the, the group they're targeting, uh, and, and where, where they're protected. And so public schools are actually way better than churches for this, um, because the, the, in a church, you're dealing with, with people from 95 years old down to, down to infants, whereas in a school, you, you can become a teacher of the age range that you most desire to target. I say it's not to justify or excuse anything on the educator or the religious side, but simply to say, if you're looking for institutions that have systemic problems with institutionalized evil, I want to say maybe the church is not the first place to look. We deserve the criticism we received, absolutely. But we are actually, from what I can tell, according to the data, doing a lot better than our peer groups. You look at the data on the Boy Scouts of America, for example, you're going to find something uh, very similar. But now, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is not actually very reassuring. Because even if it's, let's say her, her estimate is correct, and it's 1% as bad in the church, in the Catholic church, as it is in the, the community. So let's say 5% overall. 5% is bad. 1 20th is bad. That's still, like, Jesus, didn't you die to, to remove people from sin? How then is sin perpetuated by your church? Even one is a theological problem. Jesus addressed this in a parable. Matthew chapter 13. In verse 24, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds, weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? We come to Jesus. Lord, didn't you put regenerated people in your church? Where is this depravity coming from? Didn't you set us free from the power of sin? Where then is this oppressive bondage coming from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Jesus says, Satan plants agents in the church. Well, of course he does. If you were Satan, wouldn't you? If there was an institution that stymied your will, wouldn't you seek to subvert it from within to corrupt it as best you could? Jesus says that that's, of course, the play that Satan is making. And he says it's fruitless to try to eradicate. That, that if we go on some sort of purity quest, some sort of witch hunt, we'll find far more than witches. We'll actually wind up destroying innocent people. And the reason why it should be obvious to see, any healthy church is made up of both mature and immature believers, new converts, people who came to Christ a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, who are still learning things. And, and they won't measure whatever standard of purity you set there for them. Any sort of moral bar you set for them, they're still figuring things out. And so you will throw out the good bad, or for that matter, you don't become sin-free on this earth. You're going to struggle with something, and a purity net will catch everybody eventually. It's one of the problems that we're seeing now in our culture more generally uh, with, with purity uh, campaigns, pogroms, if you will, that are happening in different institutions where people are, are using a different set of values and trying to make sure everybody conforms to it. They're destroying themselves. And eventually, it'll just be a skeletal structure of what they were before. Jesus says, 
No. He gives us instructions elsewhere. When you find sin in the church, expel it. Deal with it. Reconcile if you can. Bring them to repentance. But if you can't, just put the person outside the church and keep moving ahead. And don't go on a witch hunt. It's just not a fruitful enterprise. Instead, focus on becoming holy yourself, becoming righteous yourself, and building a righteous, holy, wholesome community. Well, maybe. Maybe, the skeptic says, this is all possible. But I'm not convinced. Let's say everything that you just said is right, that, that churches are not leached to their positive economic impacts. You can find a way to measure that. And, and that churches um, do bad things, but, but they're not nearly as bad as I thought in comparison to other groups, that, that this actually disproportionately better than I ought to expect given the demographics. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Maybe. But even if all that's true, I still don't like the church because of what it does to people. Organized religion twists people. It makes them intolerant. It makes them judgmental. You get white nationalism. You get uh, homophobia. You get misogyny. You get transphobia. Uh, you just get people being jerks. That's what happens from the church. It twists people. Organized religion is bad. Well, that's not an uncommon perspective. And I usually have a very simple response, which is if you think organized religion is bad, you should see disorganized religion. It's worse. That's somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but there's something there that's worth unpacking. Uh, the deeper issue is, does Christianity make people worse? Does it somehow uh, twist people's souls so they become more judgmental? Now, this would be a hard thing to measure. The most recent research that I've seen is by George Gallup. It's pretty old. Um, it, he wrote a book called The Saints Among Us. Uh, and then he actually says, no, actually, it turns out Christians are considerably less judgmental than the populace as a whole. They're more tolerant, they're more inclusive. I think about an email that I got either yesterday or the day before from an alum uh, who was not a Christian when she started coming to Kaffa. Um, and I'm actually not quite sure where she's at on her journey right now. If you're watching this, please do let me know. I didn't follow up with you. But she sent me this email in response to one of my Friday emails that I sent out with a collection of links about how to think about what's happening in society. She said, I really do appreciate the tolerance so many in Kaffa have shown by listening to those they disagree with, even when that doesn't mean they'll change their minds. I appreciate the thoughtfulness shown in these emails and from the students in your ministry. Does Christianity make people worse? Well, no. Uh, Tyler Vanderweele, a, a researcher, an epidemi epidemiologist at Harvard, um, he has been studying the health effects of religion for some time now. And he said, and I quote, we found that during childhood and adolescence, those who attended religious services regularly were subsequently 29% more likely to have high levels of volunteering than those who did not. Those who attended religious service regularly were also 87% more likely to have subsequently have high levels of forgiveness. And those who prayed and meditated regularly were 47% more likely to have a high sense of mission. In other words, when kids go to church consistently, it makes them better, not worse. And there's all sorts of other research you could bring into this. Whoa, but you're dodging the question about being judgmental. About, about being jerks, about being homophobic and transphobic. You won't get, don't, don't try and think you can get away from that one. I'm not trying to get away from that one. But I am saving it for another sermon because this sermon is already long enough and there's a lot to cover. But I'm going to hit both directly on that and then in a separate sermon, we're going to talk about the history of the church and racism, which I think deserves its own entire service. But I will quickly say this on the subject of racism, uh, that, that people sometimes think the church is a hotbed of white nationalism. And I think that would be a shock to the modal Christian in America who is a middle-aged black woman. Uh, the church of Christ in America is far more diverse than most people realize. When people hate on Christians, they're not hating on who they think they're hating on. Uh, this is a diverse movement, and our community at Stanford is actually very diverse. If you're just with us online, I know you can't see this, go to our Instagram page, uh, visit our website, uh, go look at the, the Spotlight Series where we interview people who are part of Chi Alpha. Uh, go to our Facebook page, and you will see that we are a very, very diverse community because that is who the body of Christ is. Stanford draws people from around the world to come and from around America to come study here, and we have those who come from church backgrounds and those we reach who don't yet have church backgrounds, uh, and you will see that we're reflective of the body of Christ as a whole, and we are an exceptionally diverse community. But that doesn't get off the hook for history, and we're going to talk about that in the future. What if someone was to say, all that's fine, all that's theoretical, I have been hurt by the church, I've been wounded by religious authority, wielded badly. What would you say to me? I'm so sorry for what you've been through. I wish that had not happened, and if I was a part of that, or Kyle was a part of that, let me know if there's a way that I can help make it right. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. Hopefully I've not wounded you, but if I have, and you're still listening to me for some reason, let me know. 
Having said that, don't give up on the entire institute of, of Christianity uh, because of one bad experience or maybe even a couple bad experiences in one place. Switch denominations. Find a new congregation. If, if you meet a lawyer who's shysty, you should not conclude that all lawyers are bad. Public defenders go into it specifically to defend people against criminal charges. There's all kinds of lawyers who go out there to do good. Uh, many prosecutors get into it because they really believe in justice and they want to protect the innocent from crimes. Um, uh, lawyers, uh, some are motivated by money, but not all. They're motivated by a sense of justice and mission. Or think about um, mechanics. If you go to get your, your car repaired and someone rips you off, you don't think then the entire industry is fraudulent. You just think, I found a bad mechanic. I'm going to disrecommend that person. I'm going to go to other places and try to find a, a better deal and more honesty with churches. If you have a bad one, I'm sorry. But there, again, there's like 400,000 of them in America. Find a better one. And, and I realize that might be difficult for you at the beginning. So I would say this. If you're not ready to go to church, go to a small group, go to a Bible study, just hang out with some other people. Um, who you trust, who you trust and you know. Here's the thing, in my experience, the more you know real Christians, by which I'll leave that definition up to you, by the way, what you mean, but I simply mean this, uh, people who are serious about following Jesus, and it's obvious from their lives that that is the driving force that motivates them. The more you know people like that, the less you believe all these crazy things about the church, about the body of Christ. Because you know them, you look at them, you hear them, and you realize that they're not motivated by hate, they're not motivated by intolerance or judgmentalism, that they're very loving, gracious people doing the best they can and making mistakes along the way like everyone else is and repenting when they become aware of it and going to the heart of God as best they can and getting back grace from God to come and to transform their lives and to bless this broken world. Now, those are reasons maybe to, to or those are not good reasons then to reject the church. But is there a positive case to be made for the church? Oh yeah, church is awesome. I mean, just straight up, it's a fun place to be. Literally, churches are fun. Um, the people there are delightful. They're witty. They're smart. They're wholesome. Uh, they're very kind. They're generous. They're compassionate. It's a great place to be. Um, you Worship. Man, you go to the right church. Worship is a blast. That's not a, that's not a bug. That's a feature. Worship is awesome. Uh, the Bible says it is good and pleasant to worship the Lord, and they're not kidding. Um, I mean, just a joy. Celebration comes out of you. People dance in church. And they're doing it out of a sense of, of, of just abundance of, of, of life flowing through them. And man, the content can be amazingly stimulating. It's about how to live life better. It's about stuff like how to be a better friend, how to, how to forgive others, how to be generous, um, how to think about ultimate issues, how, how to really dig deep and, and understand complicated intellectual problems. And the best preachers are amazing communicators. I don't put myself in this August company, but the best preachers in America or in the world, they're fabulous. They're as good as any stand-up comedian you'll ever see. They're funny and they're witty and they're just pleasant to listen to. Church is great. Now, that's good. Here is, I think, a much deeper and better reason to go to church. Because that's where you're going to find Jesus. That's where you're going to find the one who died for you. The church of Christ, which he purchased with his blood. That if you want to get to know Jesus better, the church is the place to do it. So if you don't know Jesus yet, come to church and get to know him. If you do know Jesus, come be around his people. See his spirit moving in the community and learn more of his ways. Ephesians 2, chapter 20, verse 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 to 22 says, Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. You belong. Where do you belong? In this place that is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Jesus is the foundation of the church. He is the cornerstone. He is that which, which, which squares everything else up. He, he's the, the, the North Pole by which we measure our movements. We find him when we gather together. His spirit, the spirit of Christ, comes to dwell in our midst. So love Jesus and love his church. And if you don't yet love Jesus, again, come and learn more of him and you will be amazed. Now, I'm going to close with this just as a practical incentive at the end. Let's say that, that everything else that I've said has, has not quite resonated with you. Here's something that's very concrete and very simple. Um, a researcher named Robert Hummer, a professor at UNC, found that people who regularly attend religious services 
live on average seven years longer than those who do not. For context, smoking knocks 10 years off your life. In other words, not going to church is almost as bad for your health as taking up smoking. Not in the most of you. You would never consider smoking. But lots of your friends think nothing of blowing off church. And that's kind of uh, older research, some more recent research by the Harvard epidemiologist I mentioned earlier, Tyler Vanderweel. He found uh, that uh, women who attended worship services weekly were 33% less likely since the start of the study over the course of 16 years. Over the 16-year period, they were 33% less likely to die from any cause whatsoever. All cause morbidity reduced by a third. That's crazy. So here's my final pitch for going to church, for loving the church. Do you want to live seven years longer? Go to church. Do you want to live forever? Go to church. You'll be blessed both in this life and in the life to come.